Here we go. Sedimentary rocks. Someone take a wild guess from the little bits we've hinted at before. Sedimentary rocks, what are they? They're made of sediment. Other rocks, sediment, okay. Material. Material. Detritus. Detritus. Yeah, you'll hear me as a lot of words mean the same stupid thing. Detritus or clasts or sediment. All that means is particles of mud or particles of sand, or particles of sand or pebbles. And by the way, uh, mud is the smallest. You can't see it with your eye. Pebbles, hopefully you can see those with your eyes. But that's a whole gradation we'll talk about. But um, those are one type of two groups of sedimentary rocks. We'll go through both groups today. So sedimentary rocks are about the source of 90% of Earth's economic products of so things like oil and gas and coal, sand and gravel and limestone, all these things are mined and quarried for different economic uses. Um, remind me, how many of you guys in here know Wolverine Canyon outside of town, like east of Perth? And maybe I mentioned before, they're thinking of putting a quarry up there to mine limestone to make cement. I'm not terribly thrilled with that idea because that's like the only pretty place we have in Bingham County. But we'll see what happens. And then you get golden diamonds and sedimentary rock. But let me point out, they don't form there. That's where they form clasts from like igneous rocks. Well, the reason I care about sedimentary rocks and the reason paleo nerds like them like me, um, yeah, it'd be nice to be rich, but I think it's really cool to be able to look at a pile of rocks like the book cliffs right here in uh, central Utah and to have learned enough that uh, by looking at the rocks, I can kind of put my uh, binoculars on and say, oh, these used to be like a beach or a delta or a lake or a... Uh, shallow marine environment. I really like said rocks because you learn enough about them, you can basically tell the history of this place you're looking at, which I think is pretty cool. So in said rocks, you'll hear me mention strata, probably already use that word, but all strata means is layers. So if you look at the book cliffs here in Utah, has anyone been down to central Utah and seen the book cliffs as you going down towards Moab? Oh, it's pretty down there. My dinosaur class, that's where we'll go on our dino dig in a few months. But all these layers are just strata. That's what strata means. In between the layers, you'll have what are called bedding planes. So where this layer, this whitish layer, comes in contact with this darkish layer up here, that's a bedding plane. It's basically that minuscule space in between two layers. Those are called bedding planes. Those are the contacts between layers of those rocks. In this class, we'll talk a lot about rock formations. What I mean by rock formation is you have a certain set of layers of rock that have some unifying quality to them. And you're going to call that to certain things. So as an example right here, this is from Utah where I don't know my strat quite as well. This is probably like the Navajo sandstone or the Wingate sandstone. It is its own formation that is basically defined is a big pile of sand that might have a few little bits of muddy layers in it, but it's mostly sand. Down below this, uh, I'm going to spitball here. I don't know if this is a chimney formation. Let's just pretend it is. But down here, you have a formation that's mostly muds with a little bit of sandstones and silts and conglomerates. It's distinct from this packet right here, so it would have a different formation. And then right here, you have this nice bright red, probably silts and muds. And you see how you can tell the difference between these layers, these layers, and these layers. That's what uh, rock formation is. So when I talk about rock formation in this class, and I'll give you random names, um, that's what I'm talking about. So if you go to the Grand Canyon, you'll see lots of different rock formations in the walls. Like at the top right here, you have your interpretive diagram, you have what's called the Red Wall Limestone. And you have the Temple Butte Formation, the Moab Limestone, the Bright Angel Shale, all these different things, those are different formations. Now to make sedimentary rocks, you're gonna have to have sedimentary systems where you have weathering and transportation, deposition and lithification. Lithification is a fancy word meaning the rocks getting glued together, basically. It'd be a way to look at it. Well, we'll go through each of these steps. All right, so first off, weathering. Someone tell me what the weathering is. Like wind or water changing the rocks and depositing or removing. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this rock right here, Let's pretend, or pretend that it's subjected to lots of uh, rain, freezing, wind will do a little bit to it. But over time, it's going to break into tiny particles of mud. 
that would mean you've weathered this thing down. Think of like the uh, cracks that uh, you get in the sidewalk. Or for those of you that commute from Blackfoot, think of those damn potholes right over the Snake, uh, Snake River that come back every year because of the freeze thaw. That's weathering. It's where you're breaking stuff down into smaller particles. So to make sedimentary rocks, first you have to weather things to break them down. You can have what's called chemical or mechanical weathering. So these are two different types. Mechanical weathering means there's physical force, like maybe rocks banging against each other in a stream or water, transporting them and wearing them down, or even wind sandblasting something. That's mechanical weathering. You can also have chemical weathering, which is where you have things like very slightly acidic rainwater. Rainwater is normally just a little bit acidic. It's not like, I'm not talking acid rain that's really bad, but just a tiny bit of uh, acid in the normal rainwater can slowly break down rocks too, and that would be chemical weathering. To make sedimentary rocks, you also have to have transportation of sediments. If you transport something, what are you doing? Moving. Just moving it around, okay? Where do you guys think you could see transport uh, sediments being transported if we went out on a 20-minute walk right now? Yeah, on rivers or canals, okay? So those are the ways to transport day. sediments. What's that? Street on a windy day. <laughs> Street on a windy day, yeah. Um, wind, you can have sediments transported in wind. Or you're going to have to transport sediments too to make sedimentary rocks. You can have lots of different sorts of sedimentary environments depending on where you are. You can get sedimentary rocks forming in deserts and sand dunes and little tiny ephemeral lakes in the desert at the mouths of uh, mountain ranges when they come out of the canyons. You can actually get glaciers that make sedimentary rocks. You can have rivers that deposit sedimentary rocks in their channels, or they flood and dump sediments out here on the floodplain. You get sediments on beaches, deltas, lakes, out in the ocean, on the uh, continental shelf, down in deep marine environments, all over the place. But again, one thing you're going to have to do to make sedimentary rocks is lithify them. What did I say lithify means? Basically, doing them together. So the way you make, turn sediments into sedimentary rocks, so take sand or mud or silt, is you glue them together, uh, together through lithification. There's two ways. Squish them together, helps it stick together so it lithifies. And also very importantly, water flows through, remember we've got water flow underground in the water table. Water flows through those sediments and as it leaves behind and dries up, it leaves a little bit of uh, mineral glue in there, dissolved minerals, and that's how you cement it together. So you squish it and you add a little bit of uh, mineral glue, so to speak, from water that travels through those tiny pores. You can see an example on the left of sand that's not lithified. You can see all these sand grains. Of course, this is uh, under a microscope. Here you can see a sandstone that has been lithified. You have the sand grains. And you see this kind of shiny multicolor material in here. That's going to be a mineral cement. Maybe that's calcite or silica or something. I'm not super good with my mineralogy. But this stuff was left behind as water flowed through these empty spaces and dried up and left dissolved minerals behind. So that's how you get lithification. So stratification, again, what does strata mean? Layer. Layers, yeah. You can see lots of strata right here in the Grand Canyon. All right, so sedimentary rocks, there's three main tongues. Or sorry, three main kinds. I can't ever talk of it. Me speak English bad. All right, so moving on. You're allowed to laugh, it's okay. <laughs> so detrital, what is a uh, detritus or clasts? I keep asking you because you want to know this for the test. So I'm talking about clasts or detritus. What am I talking about? Sediments. Sediments. Give me an example. Sand. Sand. Someone give me another example. Very first thing, I started this lecture up and mentioned some. Oil, coal. Um, those would be a type of chemical said drop. If you're to go outside now because of all the melting snow and walk across the grass, what are you going to be getting on your shoes? Mud. mud. So mud's a type of sediment. So mud, sand, silt. And again, those are defined by sizes. We'll get to that eventually here. But you can have detrital sedimentary rocks that are made out of those things. You can have chemical sedimentary rocks, which are basically what we do when water that's full of dissolved elements evaporates and leaves it behind. So think of like salt. And then you get organic sedimentary rocks that are made mainly from living things. Right, so when you're looking at the lithology of a rock, so lithology means what it's made out of. When you're looking at lithology of a sedimentary rock, 
you're going to look at what's called composition and texture. Composition is the sort of grains that you have in there. So you have fragments of granite, you have fragments of chert, you have fragments of limestone. Is it mostly uh, quartz sand or something like that? But part of lithology is what those little particles of rock are that are making the larger rock. Then you'll look at texture. When we talk about texture of sedimentary rocks, we mean is it made out of clasts like we just talked about, or does it have a crystalline structure? Crystalline structure is where kind of sort of you can actually see that it's made out of a bunch of crystals of something like calcite is an example. So like you see in limestone. So I told you about the class size. You have gravel, sand, silt, and clay. Let me show you an image right here. This is actually how this works. So I'm not going to expect you to remember the numbers involved. I don't even know those off the top of my head. But I will expect you to remember by using your eyes how to tell what it is. So if it's a mudstone or a claystone or a shale, these are all a sedimentary clastic rock made out of mud particles. You can't see individual pieces of mud with your naked eyes. It's too small. Claystone and mudstone, we'll just kind of lump them together for the moment. If I'm talking about shale, the difference between shale and mudstone is this. Shale is going to break into thin layers, and it's going to be made out of mud. Mudstone, same thing, it's made out of mud, but it's just like a lump of glued together dirt. It doesn't have layers, and that just has to do with the environment we could posit in. But let me pass around to show you. This is a mudstone verging on a siltstone. Let's just call it mudstone. Looking at that, you can't really see the particles with your naked eye. That's a mudstone. So too small to see the particles. It's clastic. It's a mud. You could even maybe call it a shale because it kind of has shady layers. Either one of those, if I was a testee on that, I'd accept. But mud is where you can't see the particles with your naked eye. Siltstone is kind of in between mud and sand. Like sand grains are easy to see. You go to the beach, take a handful of sand, you can see the individual bits, right? Silt is barely visible to the naked eye. Sand is easily visible. So let me pass around a piece of siltstone. If you look at this one, you'll notice that the grains are just big enough to see with your naked eye, more noticeable than the one I just passed around. Then sandstone. Here's a big block of cemented sand. It's got a dinosaur rib stuck in it. If you look at this, you will easily see, especially on the broken surface where it's chipped off, you can see it's made out of pieces of sand you can see with your naked eye. So that's how you tell the difference between mudstone, siltstone, sands, oh, and uh, gravels and conglomerates. I almost forgot. This means they're made out of pebble-sized particles. When you look at this one, it's a little hard to see. I'd like to polish this so this uh, sediment size is easier to see. If I never get a lapidary wheel to polish things. But you'll notice this has chunks of green mudstone in it and pieces of sand. So pieces as big as your fingernail down to little sand grains and smaller. That's a conglomerate. Conglomerate is where you get pebble-sized particles all the way down to sand. It's like a mix, like you see if they're different sizes. There's a conglomerate. Oh, right, here's another bit. This is a better picture than the sample, just because that one, it's harder to see the class because they're similar color. But here's another conglomerate full of pebbles and sand. Easy to see. Sandstone, same thing. It's like sand. Mudstone, I just showed you. So all these rocks are made of clasts. So they're made out of smaller pieces of rocks and minerals. There are different ways that you can try and interpret the history of these rocks and how they were formed. Let me make sure this isn't a child emergency. Nope. <laughs> uh, I would have to, I suppose. But with your classic sedimentary rocks, when you look at the little clasts that are in them, so like the pebbles or the pieces of sand or microscope pieces of mud, you're going to look at what's called uh, their, I guess you'd say their shape, if they're angular or rounded. So I'm just checking here. I thought I had some slides showing actually what the hell we're talking about with this. But yeah, let me just show you just some of these, okay? So here's a conglomerate. Here's a pebble in it. Would you say that pebble is angular or rounded? Rounded. Rounded. What about this one? 
a little more angular, right? Still kind of round. Thing to remember with you know going from angular to rounded is it's not one versus the other. It's a whole spectrum from super smooth to super uh, sharp and blocky. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about angular and rounded clasps in a rock. This rock right here, the angular, sorry, the rounded one. Do you think it has moved farther away from wherever its source is than this one that has more sharp points, or do you think the sharp pointed one? Is moved farther away from its original point. Which one has moved farther from its source? Round one. How can you tell? Yeah, it's got more, it's more beat up, it's rounded. So it's the reason we care about really, really dull stuff like this and these sedimentary rocks where you're like, why are we listening to this? Is because when you look at characteristics like this, it helps you know the history of those rocks and how far they've moved. So this one, because it's rounded, it's been subjected to more energy and moved farther than this one that's kind of angular. So there's an extreme sort of, I guess you kind of call it, call it a conglomerate, but the technical term is breccia. It's where you have all these rock clasps together of pebble size, except they're super sharp. See how sharp this is? Does this stuff move really, really far? No. This stuff is uh, formed pretty close to uh, some sort of uh, river canyon coming out of the mountains or something like that. That's why we care about little nitpicky things like that. So you can also have what's called sorting. So there's rounding and there's sorting. Sorting is how well mixed the stuff is versus uh, if it's uh, less well mixed. So let me, I don't want to get rid of this drawing, but let me just do one here. So for sorting, let's say you have a rock It's full of all different sizes, like this. And let's say you have another rock that's full of clasps, similar size. Which one of these two would you say is well sorted? The left or the right? The right. Right. They're all the same size of particles. It's well sorted. This one would be how sorted? No. Poorly sorted. And remember, you can have a gradation, you know, all the way from this extreme to this extreme. But again, this helps you figure out the history of that rock and the uh, sediments in it. If it's like this, it probably hasn't been transported very far. Stuff hasn't had the time to settle out and uh, segregate. If it's like this, it's probably transported much farther. Again, this you might find close to the source, like maybe up in the high mountains where stuff's starting to erode or in a canyon coming out of the mountains. This you'd find like way at the end of the river, way far away from the mountains where everything's been sorted. Does that make sense so far? So that's why we care about weird stuff like that. You also have what's called grading. Grading is where the particle size changes over time. That's what this is. So you see how I've got big particles in the base of this rock layer here and how they get smaller as you go up? That's called normal grading. You start off with the big stuff at the bottom and it gets smaller as you go up. You can have reverse grading where it starts off as tiny and gets bigger and bigger as you go up. So imagine I flip this 180 degrees. So think of a flood. And if you have a flood depositing these sediments and it starts off with the biggest chunks of rock and debris, how much energy did that flood start off with versus have at the end? You've got big rocks first. Does it have a lot of energy or not so much? Not so much. If it's moving big rocks, does it have? Then yes, it's it was a huge flood. Huge amounts of energy. So this is like where the flood suddenly boom, this huge flood, lots of energy, and then the water kind of slows down, and you're only able to deposit smaller particles because the water's not going as fast. That would be normal bedding. If you have reverse bedding where it starts off tiny and gets bigger and bigger, what does that tell you about the floodwaters? Yeah, they started off pretty weak and it got worse and worse and worse and worse. So that's reverse bedding and graded bedding. Does that make sense? Okay. That's all the sort of stuff that I kind of think is cool because, for example, let's see where the sample is. Where's my, oh yeah, right there. So this conglomerate sample I passed out right here. This is from a spot out near Palisades Reservoir called the Robinson Bone Bed. It's the best dinosaur spot we have in the state. I go out there 
and injure myself constantly with sledgehammers because you break open the conglomerate and it's full of bones and teeth and eggshell. If you, what's that? Worth it. Uh, out near Palisades, the most no, I can say. So. I'm saying it's worth it. Oh, yeah. It hurts. I always screw up my thumb. But anyway, looking at that conglomerate, you'll notice that it's poorly sorted. And that, as far as I can tell, because the original rock was taken out by bulldozers before I got to look at it, as far as I can tell, it has reverse bedding. So if it's poorly sorted, what does that tell me about the sediments in that rock again? How far have those sediments traveled? How far? Not very far. And if I've got reverse bedding, where it starts off with really small grains of sand and gets chunkier as I go up, what does that tell me about the flood that made that rock? That it wasn't that bad. That it started off pretty minor and got worse and worse. So using that, I'm able to try and put together a history of that site. So you'll find broken bones and the beat up teeth in there showing me that these things weren't moved very far, but it started off as a little flood and then got really bad and started busting everything up. So something like a landslide or a debris flow. That's why people like me will care about all these nitpicky details. It helps us figure out the uh, history of what we're looking at. So we just mentioned that poorly sorted conglomerate, poorly sorted glacial till, sandstone, mudstone. I get ahead of myself in lectures a lot and then get to the slide and I was like, oh yeah, that's where I should mention it. So those are classic sedimentary rocks. Other group is called chemical sedimentary rocks. These are not made of little pieces of mud and sand or silt. For the most part, you might have a little bit mixed in, but these are made again where you have water that is full of dissolved elements and it gets so saturated in that water that they start to form little nuclei and maybe float to the bottom and make like a limey mud. So you guys, uh, I always talk about this, remember I'm talking about like hard water and how it leaves deposits behind. That's the same thing, you're basically making chemical sed rocks in your pipes when you're doing it. Or you can have large bodies of water evaporate and leave behind salt and stuff. So halite is rock salt. That is a super common chemical sedimentary rock. If you were to go out towards the salt flats near Salt Lake and just lick the ground, you'd be looking at a bunch of halite. You've seen it out there. Gypsum also forms that way from dissolving water. Then you can have organic sedimentary rocks that are formed from organic remains. So an example would be coal. Do I really not have a picture of this? Man, I need to go in and revise this. So. Okay, so you all know what coal is, I would assume. Anyone remember where coal usually forms? In sedimentary layers. In sedimentary layers. What sort of environment more specifically? Ocean floors. Swamps. So swamps. Coal forms where you have lots of plants in a really swampy environment, and they just get buried deeper and deeper by new plants on top. That's how you make coals. Coal is really common in portions of the eastern U.S. and just east of us near uh, Kemmerer through Wyoming, there's a lot of coal mines. Idaho doesn't have hardly any, but it's fairly common depending uh, fairly common depending where you are in the country. You can get coal, you can get what's called coquina. And I think what's happened here, for some reason, I did have pictures in here, but the formatting must be going weird. But a uh, coquina is a type of organic sedimentary rock that is basically shells glued together. Just like you glued a bunch of shells together. So it's cool for fossils if you like that. You can get coquina. One thing that's important in sedimentary rocks are sedimentary structures. So this is something else that uh, I care about and you should care about because it helps you understand the history of the sedimentary uh, rocks. So examples of uh, sedimentary structures, you can have layers or stratification. That would be a structure. It's just a little layers with the bedding planes. In between, layers generally form in quiet water environments where there's not a lot of energy to constantly mix, it, uh, mix things up. So in quiet lakes or oceans, you can get shales and thin uh, laminae is just another word for really thin layers. And these are environments where you generally, if you have layers, you don't have a lot of organisms burrowing through because otherwise they'd be messing up those layers. So. Here you can see some laminae in an ocean shale. Laminate just means really, really thin layers. These are where, um, depending on what you're looking at, maybe you'll have layers that were deposited annually, so every year. So, you know, like millimeters in thickness. If you go to uh, Fossil Butte National Monument, a few, uh, few hours out of town here in western Wyoming, you get very thinly laminated limey shales or shaley limestones that have all those fossil fish in them. But it's uh, some of those layers were deposited annually, so you can actually count the years. Again, really nitpicky and looking at those laminae. 
graded bedding. So I mentioned graded bedding already, but where I talked about it before was on a, a terrestrial landscape. So like from rivers and debris flows, you can get the same sort of thing in the ocean coming off the continental slope. Those are called turbidity currents. Here's a really good example of graded bedding and actual outcrop. You can see how it gets less coarse and less coarse as you go up, you get smaller and smaller particles. If you were just looking at this sort of plastic sedimentary rock with the pebbles, what would you call it? What did I name that one that's made out of pebble sized particles? Well, if you were just looking up here where you have chunks of sand, what would it be? Sandstone, yep. Yeah. Screw you on there with you. Right. Other sorts of uh, sedimentary structures you can get. You can get cross bedding. Has anyone ever been down towards like Zion? and the parks down there in Southern Utah, where you look in the cliffs and you see the cross beds doing like this, and there's like an erosion surface, and like this, like that. You see those in those sandstones? Basically, when you're looking at those rock outcrops, you're looking at fossil sand dunes. You can also form things like that in river environments, but that's called cross bedding. If you get cross bedding, that is a nice sedimentary feature. And that is useful because if, if you analyze it, you can tell which direction the wind was blowing from those rocks were because of the cross bed shapes. And or you can tell which direction the water was flowing. Speaking of water. And when you're looking at that ancient uh, directional water flow or wind direction, you can call that paleo current analysis. Here you can see cross beds. And the way you look at these is I forget the uh, technical terms off the top of my head, but you see how you have this long gradual slope and a sudden drop off. The direction of the sudden drop off, like you see here, indicates the flow direction. So in this case, you got the long gradual slope drop. Going off like this, in this case, you'd be going to the left or west or whatever. And that's actually good for paleo environmental studies. Here you can see some of those examples. Here we go. Petrified Jurassic sand dunes from down in southern Utah. You can get ripple marks. Some of you guys, I would expect everyone have been out to a lake or a pond and you've seen where it's left little ripple marks that look kind of like that from the top or from the bottom, like this. So you get ripple marks, so it would be sedimentary features. You can get asymmetrical ripple marks, which indicate that the flow is kind of uh, going just in one direction, unidirectional flow, like you get in streams and dunes and turbidites. Or you can get symmetrical, which means it went back and forth. So unidirectional flow would be this one. You've got it's kind of like the sand dunes we just looked at, where it goes up a ways and steep drop off. That would be unidimetrical. Symmetrical is where it looks the same on both sides. And that means the water came back and forth, back and forth, like you're on a shoreline. So when you see ripples like that, same thing. You could look at this and say, oh, this is a shoreline, or oh, this is the beach, depending on the uh, sort of ripple marks you have. I always remember in my geology class as an undergrad when I failed the question on ripple marks. It's sad, okay? But yeah, in ripple marks, seeing things like this in modern environments, how many of you guys have been out and seen like fossil ripple marks like this somewhere? Those of you in my dino class, when we go dino hunting, we'll drive past um, some outcrops where it's just ripple marks everywhere like this. And I need to stop and collect some for class. So we have some examples. We can get those as sedimentary features. You can get desiccation cracks. If something desiccates, what's it doing? Something. Drying out. So it's just like mud cracks. Desiccation cracks or mud cracks. You get Mud cracks like this in modern environment, environments, um, and you can see them in rocks. Same thing, it shows you have, a, have an environment that was wet that dried up over time. You look at it at the top, it'll look just like normal mud cracks, except, hey, these are in the rock. If you're looking at the layers, you'll see basically the little gaps coming down, and those represent, you know, or if you could clear this off and look at the top, you'd be looking at mud cracks. These mud cracks and ripple, uh, Marked rocks, by the way, are great place, places to look for fossil footprints. Now, I'm always hoping to see nice dinosaur tracks in them and once in a while. Okay. You can even get raindrop impressions. So I've seen a place down in central Utah where in the uh, shale of a 
little canyon, Triassic age, about 245 million years old. You have little footprints of these little lizards that were in a near shore tidal environment. And you'll see the little scales on their feet. You'll see the claw marks. What's really cool is you'll see where they drag their claws. So it's like long furrows. Is they're like swimming through very shallow water or on the mud. But in among those footprints, you'll also find little fossil raindrops like this, which is pretty cool. I just love stuff like that. It's telling me a story. What has to happen in order to fossilize raindrops? You have to have a sediment that holds the impression after the rain hits it. Then you have to have it dry out enough that it firms a little bit instead of just getting weathered away or mixed away. And then you have to have another layer of sediment come on top of that dry sediment. So you have to have this, this right uh, set of circumstances where you don't have things getting mixed up in between events, I guess I would say. So, Because if you came through with a big rainstorm after this and it was really rainy, you'd just obliterate everything. If you want to have just the right degree, power of rain, I guess you'd say, then it's dry for a while and the stuff dries out. Then you get some more sediment washed in, the wash is on top of it, but doesn't doesn't mix it up again. Does that make sense? A little bit. So you have to have like the right environmental conditions where you don't mess with what's already there. So you have to be lucky would be a better way to put it. So oh, yeah. other sedimentary features would be different sorts of trace fossils. So we talked about body fossils and trace fossils Monday. What is a trace fossil again? Um, things left behind by activity of living, of living things. Mm -hmm. So trace fossils could be sedimentary features. So again, you could have tracks, you could have burrows, you could, plant roots are really, really common. Um, if you go out to where I do some of my dinosaur hunting, you'll all the time see where the plant roots come through those ancient soil horizons called paleosols. And bioturbation, that's just a fancy word for basically things burrowing through the ground, mixing things up. So trace fossils like this one you saw before, that could be a sedimentary structure, some sort of burrow. As far as sedimentary rocks and where they're formed, there's like three broad areas you could talk about. You could have continental areas, meaning it's on the dry land. You could have marine environments, meaning it's like in the ocean, or you can have transitional, which is where the water meets the land, so like beaches and shores and things like that. So as far as the fossils you find in there, generally you'll find terrestrial fossils and terrestrial rocks, marine fossils and marine rocks, Sometimes you can get your terrestrial animals like a dinosaur washed out into the ocean. Let me see, pull up a cool picture really quick, actually, of a really cool dinosaur specimen that was found in ocean sediments. That is super well preserved. They just got washed into, I typed in dummy instead of money. But it's a really cool specimen that got washed in an ancient river way out in the ocean. And Super well preserved. Maybe you've seen it before. Let's see if I can get a bigger picture. Right there. So this is a ankylosaur, an armored dinosaur. But this was actually found in ocean sediments where they mine for fossil ammonites and other uh, economic things. And they actually found this dinosaur. The back part got ruined before we recognized it. But this thing is just perfect. I mean, here's his skull. Here's his nostrils. You got all those little tiny armor plates. Perfectly preserved. So rarely you can get organisms like that, uh, terrestrial organisms washed in the marine environment. But when we're talking about terrestrial environments, dry land, we can subdivide just because we like to be nitpicky. If you hear me use the term fluvial, that means river. If you hear me say lacustrine, that means lake. So fluvial deposits are rocks formed in rivers. Mm -hmm. uh, with the ankylosaur, is it, how is it, determined like you know how with rocks we can figure out how far they went depending on how rounded or jagged they are mm -hmm. is there a similar process to figure out how far fossils have moved yes you can do that's a good question so that's didn't i mention like taphonomy the csi dinosaur before when we did our fossil lesson one day so there's there's a whole subdiscipline of paleontology i like called taphonomy that's like the crime scene investigation where you try and figure out everything you can about the organism, what killed it, how long it was dead before it got buried, if somebody ate it, um, if you're looking close to the time of humans, if it was butchered, if it was scavenged, if it was transported far, like that bone bed I mentioned from that piece of rock there. Um, some bones you'll find in that deposit 
have been transported super far. They're basically rolled, rolled the little spheres of crap bone. Other ones are pristine. Sometimes in that deposit, you'll find teeth that have the whole outer surface worn away. So yeah, exactly. exactly. And that's what we would sell by wear rather than like the like. I mean, so you could do it. It would be the similar roundedness, but. Yeah, you could look at like surface damage and how rounded it is. And for that ankylosaur, the fact that it's not damaged and everything, um, it shows that it floated far away, probably in the surface, and then just uh, dropped to the ocean floor. Um, as far as figuring out how far it was from land, that's where you'd have to examine the geology and hopefully be able to trace that layer, its equivalents for tens to dozens to hundreds of miles. And you'd see a gradual change where it goes from sediments made in an ocean to sediments on a beach to sediments on a floodplain. So you'd have to have like a long correlation of rocks that you could trace knowing that it's basically the same level. So then like when we learned with the continental drift, how uh, that one guy discovered that there was similar- All Wagner, yeah. Fossils on one side in one continent, but then similar fossils on the other, but it seemed as though they had moved with like the continent, yeah, rather the same than, rocks, and just... rather than those fossils moving independently. Mm -hmm. So you could see like the distance traveled wasn't necessarily because the fossil itself was traveling, but the whole entire thing it was a part of was moving. So mm -hmm. there was less wear, like a similar amount of wear, dependent on like the entire form moving rather than just the individual fossil. Yeah, and that's where you have to do like a broader study of of all those layers of rock and how they relate to each other. And in that case, um, they look pretty much similar, like just like you took the same rocks, broken in half, moved this over here, moved that over there. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. I, I love taphonomy. I love the dinosaur CSI is pretty cool. <laughs> Let's see, so Fluvial River, the Custard Lake, can we say Aeolian, that means wind. Glacial means ice. So these are all subdivisions of terrestrial environments. Or if you hear me say marine, again, that means ocean environment. And you can also use the fossils found in rocks to help you tell what these environments were. Just realize that sometimes, again, you can have something that lived on the land that gets washed way out to the ocean, though that's pretty rare. So I already mentioned, you get all these different environments right here. If you get to a continental environment and I say fluvial, what does fluvial mean again? It means river. Oh, my throat gets dry by this time. In these fluvial rocks, or in these fluvial systems, you can get different sorts of river channels. You can get what is called braided river channels or meandering river channels. And again, I'm kind of simplifying, but braided go all over the place. You'll see a picture in just a minute, and they're full of gravel and sand, and they kind of weed it, weave in and out. Think of like braiding your hair if you have hair, okay? Or meandering, that means it's just kind of la, 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 not taking a, a specific course, and it's going to have smaller sediments in it, not as much energy. But so this makes sense. Let me show you here. Uh, so here's a fluvial river system. In this case, this is it actually dendritic, which I didn't mention. But when we talk about dendrites, that means like this crazy pattern of things connecting like weird tree roots or something like this. So it'd be a dendritic drainage pattern for. I'll talk about that with this next one here. So for braided streams that I mentioned, you see how it looks kind of like braiding your hair, how they come in and out and connect each other and go away again? That's a braided stream. You usually get these in higher elevations where the land is steeper because there's it's steeper, there's more energy from gravity making this stuff move all around. It's more messy, that's a braided stream. Braided streams is rock deposits would be easier to recognize because they're full of larger particles, more conglomerates and pebbles and sand, would be, in general, a way to recognize braided streams. I'm simplifying a little. So you can see an example of braided stream deposits, same thing. You see how there's a lot of gravel and sand in this stuff, and it's not super muddy, but it's got larger particles. This would be an example of sediments deposited by a braided stream. Meandering streams, think of the Snake River right around outside of town here. They just kind of go back and forth and do their thing. That's a meandering stream. They're not a whole bunch of channels interconnected. It's one main channel, give or take, that just kind of takes its time. These meandering streams are where, will occur where it's flatter, farther away from areas of erosion and areas of high elevation. It's where things flatten out 
and they carry, in general, smaller particles like sands and muds and sills. If you look at the Snake River, though, out here where it's meandering, we got a lot of sand. We still do have a lot of gravel in here because we're close to mountains. If you go up towards Jackson and look at the headwaters of the snake up there, you'll notice it's more braided and it gets bigger pebbles and boulders and conglomerates in the Snake River up there. This is what a meandering stream deposit looks like. So right here, you've got the meandering stream going la 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 la. And here you can see it's not so much big conglomerates, but it's muds and sands and smaller silts. And right here, didn't I basically show you guys the same slide the other day, the same image? You remember what this represents? This body right uh, here? River. It's a river channel. Yeah, it's an ancient river channel. And then what happened, this river would be filled with sediment and when it got to flood stage and it's choking with mud and sand and silt, it would deposit those out here and form these thin layers. So meandering streams and braided streams are pretty dynamic. There's always change in them. In meandering streams, you can get what are called oxbow lakes and abandoned channels. So let me show you here. So here you've got this meandering river. The way these things work as far as the energy is as the river comes around and goes this way, it's going to have more energy on this side right here, and it's going to slowly cut away and erode and go more this way. Opposite of that on this side, it has the least energy, and this is where it's going to dump out sediments that it doesn't have the energy to transport. That's how you get like sandbars on rivers and things like this. So you see this thing, eventually it's going to keep going this way. You see how there's actually a ghost channel here, so to speak? That's an abandoned channel. It used to flow this way, but due to whatever reasons, it ended up coming in this way. But what I want to show you here, so to the left or the right, where's the most energy that's eroding on this little meander? It would be on the right. On the right. So what's going to happen to this river over time? It's going to keep going out until it connects with that other channel. Yeah, and when it connects with this channel, it's going to abandon this channel. Instead, it's going to start flowing this way, and you're going to end up with what's called an oxbow lake, which is where you have a channel that's no longer connected to the rest of the channel, and it just has some water, and it's like a little ephemeral lake, and you can see those right here. So the thing to point out with those meandering streams is they change over time. If you bring up Google Earth, let me do that, I'll bring up the Snake River, you can just look down from an aerial view and see how it changes over time. I love Google Earth. I tried installing it on here once, and it got taken off. So let me bring one up. I'm thinking of an example uh, near my hometown that did something similar, but it was a it was kind of like a reef because it was connected to the bay. Mm -hmm. So it did a similar like oxbow streams through the whole thing, but they ended up turning into like um the tide pools, but it wasn't like an oxbow tide pool. Okay. And yeah. So the tide would flow in like all these creatures would be able to like have their water for a while and you'd see these snaking rivers and then everything like the tide would go back out but they would all empty so then all these creatures just acted like a weird median point between reef and and river those are really like biologically active interesting i'm trying to remember the tangled term for them i'm drawing a blank but um, near shore environments like that are so dynamic and fun to watch yeah you guys so here's the snake river um out southwest of blackford or whatever but can you see how you have these old channels that used to be there and what are kind of sort of oxbow lakes? So that's just super common. If you fly over, you know, next time you're in an airplane flying over locally here, and just look down at the river and you'll see all that. And you'll be like, oh, stupid Krummenacker, I remember this stuff. It's okay. So you can get those, you can get your lacustrine environments. Again, what's lacustrine mean? Lake, uh, lakes. Lakes. The custom environment uh, will often make rocks look like this, which is or thin bedded limestones or things like that. Sometimes you'll get these in shallow ocean environments too, but it's not uncommon for lake sediments to look something like this, yeah. where they're really thin bedded. Is that because they have a, like a consistent lake bed for so long and then the water rises? Yeah, and because basically there's sediment being brought in by a river or whatever, and as long as it's not a huge amount of energy to roil things up, you'll get these nice annual uh, layers. I mean, think of like the snow melt season where all your water is going to come in. So each of these might represent, okay, here's spring, the water melts, brings in a bunch of water and sediment. Okay, it dries up. 
So next spring, the snow melts, brings this stuff in, deposits some sediment, dries up. So it could just be a cyclical like thaw or rainy season. Does the color distinguish any chemical indifferences between those years? Yeah, colors can definitely like darker will be more organic, um, which could indicate, you know, more life or things like that. Um, red like this is would be iron staining. Um, if you're seeing greens or something, that would be copper. That's something where I'm not super good with geochem, but generally, yeah, the colors can definitely mean something else. All right, so we've got rivers, we've got lakes, we have what are called alluvial fans. These best yeah. develop in dry regions. So an alluvial fan is just, uh, so you see the canyon between the mountains right here. You've got water that comes down at least once in a while, washing all this eroded material out and down. It's going to spread out as it comes out of this canyon. And you're going to have literally, it was called an alluvial fan. This is just all material that's been eroded up here and dumped out here by water over time as it comes out of the canyon. And where is that? Um, these are all over the place. These are very, very common. You look at the mouth of any canyon here in Idaho, and if it's not built on and messed up, quite possibly you're going to see alluvial fans. But um, these are really easy to see if you were to go, I won't do it on Google Earth, but if you go on Google Earth and look at mountains again and look at where they come out into these flat areas, you will be seeing alluvial fans. So super common. I remember BYU um, on campus up towards Rock Canyon. We lived on the alluvial fan. You know, campus is right here. We had our little apartment complex right here and then the canyon right there. And as we were driving into town, because I was a geology nerd, in towards campus, I'd be like, oh, there's the alluvial fan. And you see that low hill that's going up into the canyon like that. So there's some more examples, same thing. So you can just see you've got the canyons right here where you have occasional water flow, at least it's just dumping out everything that water's eroding off those mountains. So you get your alluvial fans, you can get modern sand dunes. Again, a sediment uh, cemetery features like we talked about with these right here. I already told you about the cross bed and paleo direction, right? Okay, so it's kind of a repeat. But if you were to look with a microscope at these sandstones here, you'd see that they're basically made of these sand grains. Then you can get glacial deposits. So sedimentary rocks made by glaciers. You get things called drift, which include what's called till, or outwash. Till is basically all the stuff the glacier has picked up is kind of in the bottom of the glacier. And as that bottom melts from heat or friction, it just dumps out all that crap. And it's just a mix of random things. That's glacial till. Let's see right here. So the glacial till would basically be what's forming on the bottom right here. And as this stuff melts and moves along, it's going to leave that unsorted material behind. You can get glacial deposits at the front of the glacier. You can see right here where it's kind of pushing stuff down. You can have material like that. Here is an example of glacial till to show you what it looks like. So it's not super sorted. It's just basically this giant mess left behind by the melted layer. And just leave it behind this till. Again, it's not very well sorted. You get big things, little things. So you can see you have boulders, cobbled pebbles, sands, as well as clay-sized particles just vomited out to the bottom of the glacier as it melts it basically. Then you can get glacial outwash, which is basically as the glacier melts, you have these little streams and rivers. They're again going to carry sediments and deposit it. So it's gonna be a little bit more sorted because you've got water moving it around. You can get glacial outwash, things like that. Last thing, we're almost there. So many slides. Transitional sedimentary environments. So we had terrestrial, we had marine. What's transitional mean? The transitional mushrooms. What's that? Like a beach. Excuse me. Yeah, like a beach where the water is meeting the land. In these environments, you can get deltas depositing sediments. You can get uh, wave dominated sediments. You can get the tides coming in and out depositing sediments. But a delta, in case you don't remember what that is, delta is where the water in a river or something meets like a lake or ocean, and it comes out and forms that fan-shaped deposit. So you remember the alluvial fans from a minute ago? Imagine that, except instead of coming from a mountain, it's just the river hitting the ocean and dumping things out in the fan shape. That would be a delta. And you can see the Mississippi River Delta, this is not the best picture for that, in my opinion. You can see right here where the river is meeting the Gulf of Mexico, and here it's starting to dump out a bunch of uh, sediment. Is it reasonable to assume that alluvial fans have been 
deltas before? Um, if they emptied into a lake or something there, there is a lake. You can have an alluvial fan emptying into a lake, and you can also call it a delta, I guess. So, yeah, just depends on your circumstances. But, yeah, totally. Okay. Here you can see a delta from the Nile River. And, again, this is an awful picture. You can go in and revise this. Because, uh, what is this, space shuttle right here? <laughs> okay. Okay, I see. Here it is. Here's the Nile River. You can see how it's coming out towards the ocean here now. It's deposited all the sediment. So it's basically building new land along the edge of this uh, Mediterranean Sea right here, now that I can interpret it. But here's your delta coming out this way. Ah, sorry. Single dad, two kids, make sure they're alive. Okay. So you can get deltas that get affected by the tide. What does the tide do cyclically over and over and over? Uh, it washes at the, at the rock. Yeah, it comes in and it comes out. So you can get mixes of these transitional environments where, let's say you have a river coming out and forming a delta and it's flowing into the ocean. So that delta is going to be affected by the tide coming in and coming out. So in general terms, it's just mixing things up more. You can get environments like that. And these things get pretty big. You can have deltas hundreds of miles wide. Uh, this one right here, the world's largest delta from the Ganges River entering the Indian Ocean is about 220 miles wide. Give you an example. And finally, marine environments. So we've been on land, we've been transitional. We go out into the ocean, we get similar sorts of processes going on where you can have clasts, so mud and sand and silt, dumped into the ocean and washed out that way to make clastic sedimentary rocks. You can have underwater landslides. You can get these turbidity currents where you get your graded bedding. Like I mentioned, just depends on what's going on underwater there, especially if you're near the mouths of these rivers and deltas. Remember, you're going to have um, fresh water versus salt water with density differences, which means that the water is going to move things around a little more complicated. In marine environments, you can make chemical sedimentary rocks. Someone remind me, what's a chemical sedimentary rock? But acidic rains. Starts hard to the rocks together after it evaporates. It's called mineral deposit. Starts that way. Yeah, so you've got water that's saturated with dissolved elements in it, like calcite or salt or things like that again. And it gets to a point in the water, and, and you'll learn if you haven't already. I'm not good at chemistry, but the way to simply explain this is you have these dissolved elements in that water. It gets to the point where there's so much in there, the water can't hold it all in solution. So it starts to clump together and form little particles. And it will sink to the ocean floor and make like a limestone or what's called a dolomite or chert. But your chemical sedimentary rocks form that way. You can have carbonate sedimentary rocks, which form in oceans and lakes. These are things like limestone. One easy way to recognize a carbonate is if you fizz it with acid, it'll fizz because it's made of mostly calcite. You remember calcite fizzed mineral. One thing to throw out while I remember though, just because it fizzes doesn't mean it's a chemical sedimentary rock. Sometimes to make it this uh, difficult, you can have calcite that holds together something like sand grains. Sand grains aren't dissolving, but if you put acid on that sandstone and fizzes, you might be dissolving the calcite that's holding the sand together. So just FYI, fizz does not always mean automatically it's carbonate. So here's an example where carbonates form. So here's a, an atoll island where you have basically a coral reef that's being submerged. When I was at BYU for my master's, they did uh, their annual trip to the Bahamas for research that I could never afford. So I was really sad, but they'd go out there and look how carbonates form in these warm marine environments like that. So limestone is one of the most common chemical sedimentary rocks. In fact, I think it is the most common. It'll often look grayish to blackish, to dirtyish. You'll see some of it in lab today. You'll figure it out. <clears throat> you can also get evaporites, which are a type of chemical sedimentary rock that form in these environments, just like the name suggests. So what happens when the water is super saturated with material and it evaporates and it leaves that material behind. So again, think of the salt flats near Salt Lake would be an example. You can get salt, which is halite forming that way. You can also get a mineral called gypsum that forms that way. You get these again in ocean bodies or also large lakes. 
Of course, color is not a great way to recognize it, but here's an example of pink halite, which I really need to get some fresh samples so I can't make people lick them. But it'll look like that. It's just rock salt. Gypsum has kind of this feathery structure. And I'm getting tired of talking. I don't need to mention that. It's just showing where you used to have salt crystals. This is showing you where you can get salts and gypsum deposited. So imagine you've got this ocean or lake right here, and it's really saturated with dissolved salt and gypsum. That water evaporates and it starts to deposit those layers on the bottom. And eventually, it's just a dry, flat lake bed like salt flats. Here's an example of some salt deposits in Utah called the Somerville Formation, which we saw on that earlier slide, which is full of a lot of gypsum. And I'm getting tired of talking for Sid Rocks. That's all I want to say right now. We'll talk more about the rest a little bit later. So, okay. So we're going to have a five-minute break, and I will give you the lab, okay?